my well welcome um thank you and welcome to all these wonderful people who have joined us from all over latin america and the caribbean it's just absolutely magical looking at you all and just i mean so much work has gone into this process of getting everybody together and uh, you know your various academies of sciences have chosen you and selected you and so we'd like to thank them for ever putting this all together and particularly all of you for being here thank you very much indeed and this is your chance to have a conversation with my Brit, um, to make comments, to ask questions. You know the general theme, it's united by science. Uh, you're going to tell us where you all are as you speak to us, but my Brit, tell, tell everybody where you are now. Yeah, I, I almost wanted to uh, remove the camera and put it out because we have sunshine today, but it's cold. So it was freezing, so I just got off my woolen sweaters. Um, so I'm uh, now in Trondheim in Norway and it's called the Kavli Institute here and we also have a center of excellence. We had, uh, so Edward, my good colleague and I, we had, uh, we celebrated 25 years this autumn since we started the lab here in Trondheim in Norway. So, and now it has grown from two people to 130 people. So we are quite proud of this environment and there's one thing I want you to know and that is um, the slogan of our lab is not only excellent science but happy people and happy animals and not like being in uh, 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 in a Tivoli or such things but just that people calm down so that uh, they can let the passion grow that is what is important in science as well. That's a, a perfect place to start, Maybrit. Thank you. <clears throat> Why don't we begin with that question of what fosters good science? What, what environment produces a good scientist? What you need to, to have around you to do good science? Does it, it, this is your chance to speak. So who, who, would, who has a comment or question that's related to that very broad topic? Agustina, I see, I see your hand raised. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, my Brit. It's such an honor to be here. My name is Agustina. I'm from Argentina, and I am a Fulbright student. I am studying a Master of Science in Computational Biology, and I believe that a good scientist or foster a good science, science uh, one uh, must have the will to change a certain aspect of the world around him or her. I think that is that kind of motivation that drives uh, people to do amazing things. My Britt, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So you say to, to change the world and uh, I think that is something uh, we can do in, 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 in small ways and in big ways. So uh, how, how big do you think you can change the world? Um, I think that individually one can change the world in a small scale, but when we join others with the same passion, we can change the world big. I think so too. So if you would like to change the world, how would it look like? What change do you want? Mm, I want so many changes, but one of them is uh, position in Latin America as a, I mean, as a, uh, one of the most important continents making science and uh, going ahead in technology and improving economy and give the new generations new opportunities to succeed. Mm. That's a beautiful wish and uh, I think you can do it. You know, one of our greatest uh, researcher here, she is from uh, uh, Argentina. She is trained in physics and uh, we are so fond of her because she's so smart. She is so, um, and she has so much passion. Um, she's uh, called uh, uh, Soledad Cogno Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And she was trained in Bloche, 
and she was born in Patagonia. Yeah. And you know, when, when we sit on the top of Europe and think about in Patagonia, so that's, uh, that's fantastic. So no, so we, we need more people like, uh, like you and her. So that's a good contribution to science. When, when we brought all of you together, I mean, the idea behind it is that you young people from Latin America and the Caribbean are the vanguard of change. So, you know, it's, it's really, I mean, of course it's in everybody's hands, but especially it's in your hands, which is exciting and scary, I suppose. Who wants to go next? Uh, yes, Inai. Yes, um, hi, Dr. Moser, I am Inae. my pronouns are she, her, my PhD is in epidemiology, so for Brazil. So first of all, it's such a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak with you. I have been seeing uh, some of your speeches encourage young scientists, so I'm a, one of them, so I'm very happy to be here. And um, the question that I, I want to raise, it's about our point of view as a scientist. So some people say that a scientist should be neutral, a neutral figure toward its science. On the other hand, others say that we should be aware and actually take advantage of our personal perspectives in our research. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about the scientist's point of view and science. Hmm. So of course, um... The, in the ideal world, we should uh, all be objective because that is uh, natural science, the law of natural science. But we are human beings and uh, I think um, our creativity is extremely important in science. And uh, sometimes we, we need to think out of this objective ideas and so on and, and, and play with ideas and then uh, we, um, we, we, we suddenly might see things that we can measure objectively afterwards. So when we write up our stories then of course we should be honest, we should do the controls that are needed and all these things but before that then we can play around. Do you think so? Yes, I do think so, especially me as a epidemiologist, I study basically people, human behavior, so it's important for me. And as far as I study also LGBTQ plus community, for me it's important to say that I'm a cisgender woman, white, lesbian, etc., etc., just to have um, opportunity to be aware of my perspective and let the others know which um, point of view I'm talking about, how mm. I do my research or how I discuss my results in my point of view. And of course, based on science. <laughs> yeah. Now, so I, I think that, that what, what is the most important is to be honest. And uh, I think, uh, and, 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 and then to, 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 to build, build your, your data interpretations into a story that is general and interesting, but still honest. Perfect, thank you so much. My Brit, everybody sets out in science to be honest. You stress the need for honesty. Do you think it's difficult to remain honest when you are a scientist sometimes? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, it's uh, it seems like uh, now I don't push on that button because uh, we don't want to, to to speak about politics. But uh, in, in 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 some opinions, then it's better to not be honest uh, in order to, to win the game, and I think that is uh, horrible. So I'm proud of us scientists that we try to be so close to the facts and our data as we can. But of course, sometimes we need glasses or we need IDs in order to see uh, our results and, 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 and to do the good interpretations. But uh, 
um, I think that is why we should be proud. And, and then going back to Agustina, uh, you want to change the world. And I think uh, all of us sitting here, we really want to change the world. And one big, big uh, thing in the world is to be honest about facts and data. And, and there's so many people who try to manipulate the facts and we shouldn't let them. So we should be proud of what we know and tell people. Thank you. Who would like to continue the conversation? Yes, please, Jacqueline. Sorry. Yeah. Hello, good morning. My name is Jacqueline. I'm from El Salvador. I'm a Master in Urban and Regional Development. And in this same line, I'm, I'm really curious about communication, how you communicate science, because it's usually not only is difficult when you have to go through political issues, but also for social perception. So uh, do you think I, I bring an uh, idea just with with a thing you just said that you have to be confident about your data because usually also your data has uncertainty and how do you deal with that uncertainty for communicating information based in, in science so do you have an example how you challenge that that type of uh, problems or issues that usually brings every time with different topics related to science is how you communicate information and how do you make the people a uh, trust on you even when you have to communicate that your data has uncertainty oh thank you for that question so and and, and thank you to all the others for the questions too i think you have brilliant questions no this is a this is a difficult uh, topic um but um, I agree with you, communication is extremely important for us scientists. And then we have to balance on this line uh, so that we don't fall into uh, this to, to do an oversimplification so that we are not so close to our data. But we shouldn't make it so complicated that nobody can understand what we are doing. So we have to find this beautiful balance. And, and I think it's also important to say, I don't know, to some of the questions. And I can give you an example. Um, we had um, a science festival in, uh, in Trondheim and uh, the children um, had, um, uh, I, I gave it, I talked to the children and uh, then, um, uh, the, uh, the teachers ask, do you really like children to ask you questions? Because they always ask so difficult questions. And I said, yes, I love difficult questions, but I, I, I don't know the answers to all of them. And then, um, then I got uh, a, a, a question from, uh, from one girl and she was sitting there and she was so ch shy and she was asking about uh, memories and cognition and how we could be conscious and I said I know so much about the brain but I have no idea how we are conscious that is the biggest question in neuroscience so but then we started to play with it I, I said to her I can tell you about the cells that are important for memory and spatial navigation I can tell you what happens when you see something it goes through the system in our brain I can tell you what is happening when we are associating different events to make episodic memory, but I don't understand how it's conscious to us. I also know that uh, we need the hippocampus in order to be conscious because people who have lost their hippocampus either uh, from a disease or, or other, uh, other things, they feel they are not conscious. So you probably have uh, heard about um, Clive Mearing. If you haven't, you should uh, watch that video on YouTube. So Clive Mearing, he had a herpes encephalite and um, um, his hippocampus died, both, both sides. And in his diary, he was writing 8 a.m. I'm conscious. 
<laughs> Hooray! And then he was disturbed. And then uh, he came back and he was looking at his notes and he said, what? I haven't been conscious, but now I'm conscious. And then he wrote down. So, you know, we, 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 know, we know what brain structures and all these are important, but we don't understand what is consciousness. So I think if, if, we, if, we, if we give stories from our science and then say, this is the limits to what we can say, but that is what is making science so fun because there's so many questions still that we need to solve. What do you think, Jacqueline? Usually here it's like we, I work with forecasters, but usually weather forecasters, they usually don't know exactly what is going through the atmosphere because there are a lot of different parameters you have to deal with for saying what is going to happen in one hour or in the next days. So usually people wanted to know exactly. And for them, it's really difficult to deal saying we are not pretty sure that this condition will be like that. But they have to deal with that all the time and we are learning and the thing you said about saying we are not sure or we do not have enough information for saying what will be it's really good for them also to know that also scientists continue working for dealing with the thing we still don't know mm -hmm. and this is the a uh, good uh, thing why scientists exist because we still do not have a, a knowledge about everything so if we know everything we are not here we is not needed for us to be having these conversations exactly but but uh, but as you say even to predict the weather you need computation skills and there are all these errors but still uh, if you compare to uh, 100 years ago, the predictions that we can have now, it will rain in one hour, is just amazing. So I yes, think it's yes. important to show how advanced science is these days. Yeah, 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 sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Jacqueline. Beatrice. Hi, everyone. Hi, Madrid. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm from Brazil also, and I am a PhD student in biomedical science. I would like to go back to the comment made by Inai. Um, it got me thinking about diversity. And I think we cannot talk about diversity without talking about the challenges that we let people face when trying to be scientists. So knowing the importance of diversity in science, I would like to point to the implicit bias that we led in and also black scientists like myself fight against. And this was recently brought to my attention by a paper of Calaza and colleagues. It was published earlier this year. And this group is actually from my graduate program from Fluminense Federal University. So basically, they state that even conscious people can have their judgment affected by these implicit racist associations that are based on social stereotypes. And indeed, in the scientific community, we see several consequences of racism, such as lack of Latin and Black representation on editorial boards, on leadership roles, and etc. In fact, um, if we look at 2021 Nobel Prize winners, there was 13 laureates, and there's only one black man, one woman, and zero Latin. So, like an example, we need to fight this. And this paper suggests several elections to mitigate this effect. It's very interesting. I strongly recommend everyone to read it. So I'd be honored to hear your thoughts on this topic, um, implicit bias. It's very interesting for me especially being a woman yourself and probably suffering yourself from implicit gender bias. So thank you for, for this question. And um, of course, it's, it's very, very difficult. And uh, what, what, what we can say about the human brain is this need 
to, to, to learn about the environment by putting things into categories. But then it's equally important to think about that this is just a need that the brain has and it shouldn't be like that. And then, for example, a woman and a scientist at the same time, what type of expectations do you have to a female um, scientist? Um, and, 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 and there should, should be no difference between that category and another category because it, it depends again about the data and not the, uh, not the idea that you have about the certain category. But what, what I think is important is that we who are part of these categories, we, we just have to work harder to widen up each category so that people don't have these ideas about how a person in one category is. And uh, as, as we heard from people uh, already today, and especially Augustus, uh, Augustina started this, we want to change the world. And I think one way we can change the world is not to at least we, we shouldn't put too much of our attention and ideas into the category that people try to put us in, but we should feel free and then show off. I'm a female scientist. I'm a scientist. Forget about the female because that is not relevant for my work. But I know it's very difficult. And we need strong people, as you say, models that could be in front, who can fight their way. And when it comes to females, which is my category, then uh, in, in, in Norway and in Scandinavia, we have had brave females fighting the way so that my category, my female category is much, much wider than it could have been 100 years ago, then I couldn't have even a position at the university. So we just need to, to march along and then show off. Our category doesn't matter. What matters is our passion and our data and our ideas. And I really believe in diversity and not only I, but uh, uh, here at our institute, diversity has been the number one rule for us because um, when Edward and I started 25 years ago, then we thought what is going to kill our dream to build an institute is if we clone ourselves. We need diversity because we need to be creative and in order to be creative, we need people who are thinking different thoughts from ourselves and who dare to challenge ourselves. And that is how development happens. So be, 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 be proud of your category, but widen it up. Be strong and be a good model. And we believe in you. Thank you so much. Uh, I try to be as strong as possible, being a black woman, a Latin woman. I, I try to represent my category. And you talk, you talk about diversity. And it's so important because we know that diversity leads to better science. So why not improve diversity? Why not bigger? So thank you so much for your comments. May I ask a question of Beatrice, which is, as you say, um, in, the, in the recently announced Nobel Prizes, there were only men awarded science prizes. How, how depressing, how, how difficult does that make life for you? Because um, it'd just be interesting to hear your perspective. For me, being a Brazilian scientist, and 
I think this brings another question, not only about me being a black woman. We have political issues here in Brazil, so I think it's not the point. But for me, winning a Nobel Prize is something like dreaming, something I can never achieve because we never see ourselves in, in the winners. So it's difficult to dream about something you never see anything, anyone like you. So that's it. <laughs> I, I have nothing because I, I don't dream of it. It's just <laughs> it's unachievable. Beatrice, can I say something? Because you know Marie Curie, she was the first. She had no her. model. <laughs> she had no model. She only saw the men in front of her. And she said, I don't care. And, and what is important is that we all, we all um, experience uh, failures, that people don't treat us well, and, and, and all these, these problems that we, that's part of a, a real life. What is dangerous is if we start to attribute those challenges to our category because then it might be a self-fulfilling property. And I think that is what uh, um, Madame Curie did. She refused, she, she just had glasses on. I don't care if I'm a woman and then there uh, had been no women doing what I'm doing. I don't care. And if people treated her well, I don't care. It's not because I'm a woman, it's just because they're stupid. So just, don't don't look don't let them define you that's dangerous define yourself feel your strength and your passion i i believe that being brazilian when we say it's something unachievable to win a nobel prize for example we have several questions involved. It's less like because I'm a black woman and it's more like because we don't have investments. We don't have anyone um, in pushing us to do better. Inai here is from Brazil, she can prove my point. We don't have investments. It's more of a political question when I say that it's unachievable, more than my category, my, me being a black woman. So. It's such a, a tricky question. There's so many things involved that it's, it's hard. But maybe I'll be the first. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> that would have been fantastic. I think also that I don't know how easy it is, but if if you go uh, abroad, then you don't depend on your own countries not putting so much resources into science, for example. And then you can go to a place where there are more resources and exploit that. And then uh, the, uh, at least the, the problems um, would not be, be too big then. Okay. And that's, that's a fascinating theme as well, whether to stay put or whether to leave the country, your country behind. It's, these are all such good things to discuss, especially in the context of the region. And but it's you can hard. come back. That is what is important. And then you can come back and then show off. Alexandra, I think you were next. Um, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Alexandra Diaz. I am from Peru. I am studying physics at San State University. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I want to talk about the promotion of science. Uh, currently, I think there exists recognition to scientists and their work, like the Nobel, the, the, like the Nobel Prize or other acknowledge, inter, uh, another international or national acknowledgements. Nevertheless, I consider that the knowledge of these types of recognition is restricted to the scientific community and not to the general public. I believe it is a problem because it limits the scope of important scientific works. Also, the fact that there is no, uh, there is no diffusion of the various scientific personalities uh, prevents that they could be, that they could become references 
that motivate uh, young people to study science. What do you think about this lack of social recognition? Hmm. So, um, I don't know how it is in Peru, but I've been there. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful country with beautiful people. Um, I don't know how um, how much um, interest people have in science in Peru, but uh, when I was there, uh, there were so many other topics to think about in Peru that uh, overwhelmed the people I, I spoke to. So maybe that is uh, what has happened, I don't know. But what I can say is that um, I, again, I can I can speak for myself in my country. And um, what has happened, especially after the corona, then people have realized that we need science in order to get vaccines and to get medicine to the benefit of humankind. And after this, then uh, it is uh, people uh, are, are more fond of science than sports. And Norway has been uh, people of sport idiots. Excuse me, all <laughs> people, but it's, it has been extremely important with, uh, with uh, uh, ski competitions and soccer competitions, and they are so well paid and uh, it has been so important. So after the normal people have seen that, in fact, if we didn't have science, we wouldn't have any vaccines. And that would be extremely terrible. So I think this awareness that we see might increase uh, the, the, the interest in, in, in science. What, what field in physics, uh, are, what are you studying in physics? Maybe it's so complicated that it's difficult for normal people to understand. What, what is your field? Uh, my field is computational physics, but it is oh, yeah. applied to medicine. Okay, so you you make uh, models then, uh, cows theory, or uh, what kind of models do you make? Uh, currently, I am working in artificial networks in uh -huh. order to predict um, in order to predict uh, cardiac compromise in Chagas disease. Okay. Yeah. So you know that that might be a challenge to to tell people. But uh, um, what is possible is then to say how complicated it is, that, uh, so that we need machine learning or artificial intelligence in order to understand the big picture. And that's the same with the brain. There's so many brain cells billions of brain cells and we need uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in order to understand the complexity to make it simpler so that we can tell people about it but um yeah i'm, I'm sorry I, I i don't have that many solutions to it so i I'm, I'm curious about if there are other people who have some solutions to your question that may, may, may come up in the discussion. Um, Gabriel, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Maybrit. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to meet you. My name is Gabriel. I'm from Colombia. I study psychology and I personally love experimental psychology, psychobiology and neuroscience. So for me and many psychologists, you are like a big idol. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I think a uh, good scientist is one who has like an open mind and, and is open to diversity and particularly diversity in knowledge. In that sense, my question is directed to know a little bit about your transition from psychology to neuroscience and neurophysiology, because in my country, psychology is not considered as least recognized socially as a science or as important mm -hmm. as a hard science and people find it hard to understand and believe in the knowledge that is produced in the area. 
Um, so uh, in my country and maybe in Latin America, this belief, this, this belief builds up great walls and impediments for many of us who are trying to get opportunities in science with like interdisciplinary dialogue with other sciences. So I was wondering how your transition from psychology to neuroscience and medicine was. If in your country or in your life there were like impediments like those or doubts about your skills and what would you say to be to young people like me who are pursuing psychology or careers in science that are like devalued in their in their country mm -hmm. yeah so you know um when i was in high school i didn't know what direction I wanted to take. So then I was thinking, I want to go to, to the university that I know, but I'm, I'm going to select the topics that I liked in high school. And that was mathematics, uh, physics and uh, chemistry. So I started studying that. But then uh, I, 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 I couldn't see myself working as a, a professor <laughs> at that time. So I, I wanted to, to go into uh, questions that I, I was more, um, uh, that I could live with uh, for, for, uh, for a longer time, even though I, I, I loved mathematics and physics. So then I, I started uh, together with, uh, with my colleague, uh, Edward Mosa in psychology. And you know, coming from physics and mathematics to psychology, and you said it, there are not so much data in psychology. You have wonderful uh, theories. You have also uh, in behavior psychology, you have some data, but not so much as we are used to in physics and uh, mathematics. So I had to go a long way with myself uh, when I started in psychology. And then I came to my professor uh, in medicine and he was so skeptic, as you said, to, to, towards psychologists, what do you know? <laughs> but then what he said is that we were allowed to take a master degree with him because he was lacking the skills in behavioral analysis and design. So then we, we were allowed to work with him. So I think what, what we have to, like we talked about earlier, our categories, who cares? What, what we need to, to think about is what, are, what questions can we address with our knowledge and our methods that we are trained in? And then just go for that. And what people are thinking about those, you know, people, they think so much, but some people, they think good talks too about those. So select the good talks harvest them and then enjoy your, your science and psychology of course it's important because you're thinking about why do we behave like we do and you try to understand the laws telling us why people and animals behave like they do and are thinking what goes wrong and what's good in a healthy brain so be proud of your psychology I'm proud of mine. And then going to, to neuroscience, it was again, uh, because I went into medicine too. Then I had both physics, mathematics, medicine, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, neuroscience is the, is the most, um, um, the, 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 the topic where, where you need all kinds of backgrounds. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a big pool of, backgrounds and ideas and diversity is absolutely important. Thank you. <laughs> Talking of diversity, it's so exciting to have five different hands up from five different countries and I've, I've got you in order. So first of all, Maria Rios from Costa Rica. Hi, my name is Maria Laura Rios. I'm from Costa Rica and I'm a master's student in uh, biomedical science. I believe to be a good scientist, you have to believe in what you're capable of. However, sometimes that's easier said than done. <laughs> have you ever deal with the imposter syndrome? And if you have, what have been your tools to overcome it? 
Um, so if you mean if I uh, if I felt tired or that I I felt that I couldn't solve things myself, is that your question or like I don't know like you are in this position and you have you are doing these experiments, but like you know you can do it, but sometimes you don't believe in yourself. So like that that yeah. question that doubting yourself about what you can do yeah no so so what uh, what is important um in uh, science is that it's not only about one person it's about a community of scientists working together and then um i i don't know uh the most detailed programming uh, in our lab, but we have people here doing physics and programming to to make programs so that we can analyze our data. And I, I'm, I'm very happy about that because then uh, if I can talk to this person and this person can talk to me because it's about communication so that we understand that we address the same question, that is fine. But of course, we, I, I, I think it's, 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 not, it's not about being decorated myself. It's about getting answers to questions that I have. And then if I need to go and ask for help, which I do all the time, I'm so happy when I get the answer. Mm -hmm. I guess it's about having those networks of support, isn't it? Um, that you know, if you have imposter syndrome, you need people around you who tell you that you've got it wrong and you can do it. But I guess, and you have them, my Brit, you've built them up around you and you have them from collaborations. Maybe working in, in less supported places, it becomes more difficult. I don't know. Maria, I, I don't know whether you have a comment. I well, I believe that sometimes it can be difficult, especially like we are from Latin America. We know that here maybe we don't have like all the money that we would like to do all the science that we would like, but having a good advisor, having good classmates, uh, people who believe in you, family who believes in you, I think that's pretty important and I don't know maybe someday <laughs> we'll be working in another lab and bringing bringing knowledge from outside to our countries so we can do better science here at, at least that's my hope <laughs> I think everybody wants that like to improve the science that we do here in Latin America I guess we have to believe in ourselves and surround ourselves with people who believe in us also. Mm. Thank you. Fernando. Oh, sorry. My no, I, I, I just want to say that uh, the most important tool you have is uh, your brain. And uh, I don't see why not the brains in South America are as good as in the rest of the world. So you just have to use those brains for the best. And I know you can. Fernanda, please. Hi, Maybrit. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Fernanda and I'm from Mexico and I'm an undergraduate student of biomedical science. Um, the way that you have talked to us about science has been very inspirational. And I would like you to ask, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what have been your greatest satisfactions during your scientific career and how these satisfactions have helped you to face the challenges you have faced over your career? So I'm, um, in fact, 
grateful every single day that I'm allowed to be in this environment where we have these brilliant young minds doing such good work and especially when we have worked very very hard on either writing a paper or to understand a problem and then we start to see how it looks like it's it's like uh, doing really hard mathematics and you you really want to solve uh, the question in mathematics and and you can't and then suddenly you see it or if you put a puzzle big very difficult puzzle on the table and you see all these pieces and you don't see the picture and then suddenly something happens and you see the picture i think that's that's a secret that we scientists have when we are allowed to understand something that we didn't understand before even by reading papers by other people from other labs when we understand something that we didn't understand before at least i get so happy and that is lifting me a few levels up and then to share this among our people so what we do have at our institute is that we have different clubs so we have journal club when uh, people present papers from other labs and if you don't have that in your institution you should get that that's so fun because then you read a paper you go through it and you can discuss it and enjoy the science in it and then we have other clubs where we uh, have uh, people presenting their work and and so on and, and this is so important because, at least for me, the reason why I'm in science is that I'm so curious. And my curiosity is putting me into uh, a, an insane craziness because I really want to understand, I want to know. And, and if, if, if I have to read to know, then that is also fine, but it's just this I just need to understand. That comes up again and again in conversations with Lauritz that they, it's just this insatiable desire to know and n not letting anything stand in the way of needing to know. And of course, the Lauritz are to a certain extent the people, the lucky ones whose curiosity was able to find an avenue to flourish. And if you're, if nobody will support you and it's just, too de depressing then i suppose the, your curiosity might vanish but it again and again curiosity is the driving force isn't it Margaret? yeah and and all of us are allowed to read and when we read then we can change our minds and when we change our minds then we can change the world Bruno, please. Good afternoon, Dr. Moser. My name is Bruno. I am from Brazil and I am a medical student. I go by the pronouns he, him, his. <clears throat> so first, I just wanted to share that what I wrote down here for being a scientist was curiosity and also the eager to know and to always thrive for new knowledge and not being content with whatever they tell you, but to search for the answer. And when it comes to interest, I was just thinking about how recently we've been experiencing some loss of investment and interest in science around the world, especially when we when it comes to Latin America, when we talk about financially, but also interest in general. For example, how we see here in Brazil that we see less and less investment by the government and also some, um, some people sharing false information, especially during the pandemic. 
And I just wanted to hear more about you. Um, how you think the importance of general and also governmental support for the progress of science in general? Of course, that is uh, extremely important to have the support from the government. Um, and um, again, there has been a change in Norway because uh, earlier then um, we, we uh, in, in Scandinavia in, in, uh, and especially I think in, in, in Norway, we had this beautiful idea that everyone should be equal. But you know, in, in, in science and in university systems, it, not everyone can be equal. And then you have to, 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 to give more money to those who really want to do something big. And that has been a challenge in Norway. And even with the oil money that we have in Norway, this idea was difficult. So what happened in 2000 was that, uh, in 2002, suddenly Norway changed and they allowed something that they call center of excellence. And you know, people didn't believe, is this possible in Norway? Because it's, it's quite um, egalitarian. And it was possible because there had been people working really hard, lobbying with the politicians and telling that if you want the country to, 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 have, um, to, to survive after the oil, you need science. But it's a hard job to take and it's not a job for everyone. But if there are some people who would take the challenge and try to convince politicians and even become a politician him or herself, of course, that would make a big change. And we have had medical doctors, for example, being uh, politicians. So our first female prime minister, she was a medical doctor and she was in love with science and she was pushing the system and people have followed up after that. But, but then, you know, in politics, it goes back and forth and back and forth. So you're never safe when it comes to, to politics. Um, but uh, what, what I think is, uh, it's 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 a it's a big challenge but you've seen you've you've seen people for example like malala you know the girl who was shot uh, by taliban and she was raised in a refugee camp and now she has this big powerful foundation a girl. She was raised in Pakistan, if I don't think, uh, if I don't remember wrongly. So this girl, and even shot, she has brain damage because the wound went through her head. Still, she is in a position where she can put a lot of power and force into politics. And she's invited by the UN. She has been traveling around the world. She's a strong, strong woman. And everyone can be a strong woman or a strong man, if that is um, your, your fortune or if, if, if that is your passion. If, if not, then we can do other things. I think there are people around who can do it. What do you think yeah. yourself? Yeah, I truly agree that um, I think it's important for us uh, scientists um, to be involved in, sci in politics as well. I think how, uh, as long as we 
get involved with politics, not spe- uh, not exclusively directly into politics, but be interested in it and take uh, some actions to work towards the betterment of um, our politics and investment. And so the government can be able to understand the scientific community as something important and valid, I think it would be very important. So I, I don't know how other countries in Latin America is, but I think our cultures sometimes are pretty similar. Uh, in Brazil, I think general population is not, uh, is not very interested in politics when it comes to the actual change. And I believe that if us scientists and new and young leaders that we are here talking to you think if we try to do some change and take some action, we can do some noise, you know, and try to change at least some parts and try to excel in what we're doing and make science be better recognized by the people and by the government i think if 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 you are fighting for science or some have have a a, a, a bigger mission than yourself then people will follow so and it's possible to start in the small groups and then expand and if if you have something interesting to say, to tell, and people believe in you because you believe in yourself and you believe in what you say, then you can get followers. And you know, now with, with the new technology, um, we don't live in the dinosaur time any longer with TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, whatever technology, there's so much you can do. And you know that uh, in, in some countries where they don't want to have a change, they stop these platforms. So you can use these platforms too, and it's cheap. Stefania, you wanted to jump in. I know we have other questions coming, but please. Good morning, Maybrit. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Stefania. I am from Colombia. I have a master's degree in biological science. Um, my question is related to the question that, that asked uh, Bruno that, and that, we, that Bruno says. Colombia is the second country in Latin America that uh, have the highest investment in mil- military spending. What do you say to the leaders of countries like Colombia so that they understand the need to invest in science and not in war? Mm. <laughs> So I, I think um, when, when, we, when we go out there and are screaming and uh, telling people, why don't you support us and we are just in a bad mood, that doesn't help. What do help is when we are enthusiastic ourselves so that people believe in what we're doing and they want to support us. And I think that is what happened with Malala since we spoke about her. She really believes in education. Not, she doesn't believe in herself, but she believes, or she doesn't think about that. It's not her person who is in, 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 in the forefront, but she believes in education for everyone. And then she's just talking enthusiastically about that and education we know is what is important for humanity because if you have an educated mind then people hopefully understand that it's more complicated than uh, the lies that some people will come about how the world is so to be enthusiastic, to, to, to have something content to come with, new information that people experience as important for them. 
then it's easier to get people to to go out and and fight and be angry and all these things you can scare people to follow you but that is not good thank you thank you Maybrit. thank you stefania daniel bonilla um hello uh it's an honor to be here my name is daniel monia and i'm an undergraduate student of uh, applied economics I also really like uh, Bruno's uh, participation. It is, in fact, very related to what I wanted to, to mention. And it's that uh, we have been talking a lot uh, in this conversation about uh, financial support to, to science. But I think before financial support, there has to be the willingness uh, to recognize that science can, in fact, help uh, your policy making and it, it can uh, help development in uh, any country. So uh, uh, just one one thing that I wanted to mention, like speaking a little bit a little bit about my country's uh, situation, is that for example, I used to be a part uh, I used to be part of a team, uh, one of the I want to say biggest teams in uh, economic and institutional research here in Nicaragua, but it due to some political uh, situations it had to suspend operations. And the same thing has happened for more than 40 uh, NGOs here in the country for the last year. So I think I wanted to ask you, what do you think us uh, young scientists can do when not only policymakers and governments do not encourage uh, uh, scientific research, but also negate it and attack it. And uh, we don't really have the opportunity to use, make use of our knowledge and create knowledge towards, uh, towards uh, I mean, for development, for developing our, our countries. You know, when you come with such stories, uh, I, I, I just get very sad. But uh, there was one um, person, a, a friend of me, and uh, he called me to ask me about something uh, a, a few, few weeks ago. And then he said, uh, we, we just discussed uh, some um, enrichment in children and so on. And I said, yeah, this is so important. I believe in it and so on. And then he said, my bit, when, when you lose your hope, for a change, you are dead. So I refuse to kill my hope for a better word, but I understand that it's an awful situation in your country. But what I think we should do when we see these awful situations is to read some history. And we know that there are changes in every single country from the good to the bad, from the bad to the good. And you know, when, when people attack, they attack your hope. Don't let them. See if you can find platforms where you are safe. And, and, and spread the good word. Are you allowed to have Facebook networks? Are you allowed to have Twitter networks? Are you allowed to have groups that are not attacked? If you are, use that. Make a change. But be, be careful. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to bring to, to the table uh, the fact that things uh, like this are why I think this kind of regional uh, efforts to speak about science and to uh, yeah promote science is, are really important, really. You are here today and people will see you speak. Your voice is heard. 
And it was very clear from IANAS, the overarching body of Academy of Sciences, that they felt that bringing you together might give opportunities for you to help each other in the future and to act as kind of agents of change. So there's faith in you from the overarching body of IANAS. So that's something. Uh, Trayvon. Hello, Dr. Moser. It's such an honor to be here with you all in this call and with these brilliant people as well. Uh, my name is Travon Shirbrashad. I have an undergrad in computer science. The guys talked about finances, so I won't, really, I won't really go over that again since it's a problem that basically plagues us all in this region. Some of the things I find to be most important on being good scientists stems from, from our sense of curiosity and our collaboration. I am thankful to have a brilliant pair of supervisors who led me in my undergraduate program. Um, on my thesis, uh, Ms. Penelope de Freitas and Mr. Lenandler Singh, on my thesis on investigating the usability of augmented reality against conventional micro-navigation. My question is, how do you deal with disagreements or difficult collaborators? What happens when there's no sense of professionalism in the situation? Ignore them. <laughs> Just don't, don't, don't let you be put down. And as I said, if people put you in a category that uh, you don't feel is, uh, is too narrow, or if you feel people are uh, not kind, think about them that they might have some sides in their personality that could also be kind, but you haven't seen it yet. And don't pay attention to the bad sides of these people. Don't let them hurt you. Margaret, you Thank seem you such so a much. good person, and you're so you're so you have such sort of faith in everybody. But what what do you do if if I don't know, Travon's um, sort of nightmare comes you know to the worst extent, and people start stealing his data or you know publishing his results without his name in it? How do you deal with that sort of situation where things you lose control? We lose control sometimes, and that's how it is. So, you know, if, if people are so mean that they do these things, let them be mean, but don't let them kill you. Don't let them re reduce your hope in humanity. Just try to ignore it. It's like, my, uh, it's a, this, is, this is a stupid example, but it was the first one I was thinking about. My daughter was uh, uh, in, in, in this market and she had some clothes that she wanted to sell and some other people were around. And then some um, person just stole uh, one of her clothes and she was calling her, Mama, somebody stole my clothes. And then I told her, let them, you still survive maybe this person needed your trousers and bless them because if 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 we if we if we pay attention to and and even what what is what is dangerous is if if we start to think that people are evil that's dangerous because then we get scared and when we are scared our focus is like this and we are lacking solutions. Don't be scared. Don't let people hurt you. They try, but and, 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 and then believe in yourself and believe in your hope. And, you know, the, the, the most beautiful movie I've seen, of course, I've seen many, but, but just the, on, on this topic is it's about a hundred year old man who is in this hospital for elderly people and you see him lying there and you think, oh, this man is going to die tomorrow. And then suddenly something happens and he escape from this hospital and at the end of the scene, he is in Indonesia together with a big elephant on the beach. And, and it was a crazy movie because he, 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 he did all kinds of, of, of uh, traveling and so on. But, but, but my point is that we don't know what will happen tomorrow. And since we don't know, we can have good hope. 
for tomorrow. Don't let bad people ruin your life and don't let them kill your hope. And if they want to steal something, then bad. You can do better, you can produce more data. Thank you very much indeed. We might all be the hundred year old man who jumps out the window then. It's a nice thing. <laughs> yeah, we can we can we can shape our own future by believing in it. Joachim. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I am Joaquim. I am from Mexico and I am uh, studying a master's degree in neuropharmacology. Um, I had a question about um, what is your vision of the future of neuroscience? In other words, um, where will future research go? Mm. I can, if, if you allow me, I can tell you a tiny, tiny bit about my own research where I think that is going. What I think will happen in, 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 in my research is that uh, we now get new tools so that we can record for many, many cells at the same time, thousands of cells. And then we need physics in order to understand the processes and the connections between these cells when these cells uh, are part of a function. And then if we start to understand that in one area, for example, in the area that I study, like uh, entorhinal cortex that is important for spatial memory, then we can maybe, hopefully, get algorithms, the rules that these nerve cells are following. And then we can ask the question, if we move now to a new area in the brain, do we see the same algorithms? Can we understand what is happening and, and how plastic is the system? How, depending on the sensory input, is, is, there, is there processes in the brain that we call are low dimensional, that are not so um, depending on sensory input and, and all these questions. And then hopefully this knowledge about the normal brain can be important for understanding what goes wrong in the brain where you have both psychiatric diseases and also other brain diseases. So that is my hope. Thank you. And I can say one thing more since Travon was uh, asking, if you understand uh, the basic, basic algorithms of some, and, and, and there are some areas like the entorhinal cortex that are re really low dimensional, you can put in a chip <laughs> and do some of the work, maybe, and help people who have lost their cells. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Catalina. Hello, um, I'm Catalina, I am from Chile, and I am a PhD student of the Molecular Genetics and Micro biology program. So I have a question. Uh, I am curious uh, whether you have ever bumped into a wall during your research? And if you have, how have you overcome it? Oh, oh that is so important. Of course, there are walls everywhere. Sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. And if you don't see them and you bump into them, it hurts. And <laughs> that is how it is. And then uh, uh, I was invited to the research council in Norway to, to give a talk and then I thought mm, it was about science. What can I tell about science? And then I thought maybe I can tell them about the rules you need to follow when you go in the mountains in Norway. And one rule is you have to know when you turn around. So if you hit a wall, either a visible or invisible a wall, if it's hurting or not hurting, you have to know if you have to turn around and how. 
And, and I think that as a scientist, you have to know where the wall is and if it would be good to, to, to make a move. Exactly. How can we identify the wall? Because most of the time we kind of see it. Mm. It's, um, it's such a challenge. So, so I'm being a supervisor. I feel that is part of my duty as a supervisor to help. Uh, the students and the researchers in my lab to see walls if there are walls so that we together discuss how how we're going to solve this we are hitting a wall we don't understand what is happening what turn should we do and then we try to solve it together okay, but i i think that donald from haiti is the only person we haven't heard of uh, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Donna. Uh, I'm from Haiti. Uh, I am a, a PhD entomologist a student. Uh, I would like to, to ask for the doctor, uh, Dr. Mabel's mother, uh, one question. But uh, the situation of my country uh, is very bad. But uh, this size is the late for uh, the situation. I would like the doctor to uh, what is the word of the scientists and the situation? situation. Don't lie. I've I, I'm, I'm, I'm speechless because I know the suffering in Haiti. And of course, I've, I've just read about it. And I, I, I can't even feel close to, to what, uh, what is happening there. And then I understand that to do science and follow the curiosity feels a bit almost to say it in in a bad way selfish if you understand if you if you're not out there to 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 rescue uh, the world and so on but the only thing i can say is that at least with with science as we know you don't know always the benefits of science and if you if you have heard about the crisp r technology that uh, uh, they just received uh, the, the Nobel Prize for last year, they started to study bacteria. And who would think that studying bacteria could make such a success for a technique that they developed for the whole body? for humanity, for, for changing so much. So I think sometimes, even though it, it, it feels like there's so many other big problems that we need to, to solve, still, it must be allowed to do something out of curiosity, because maybe that will be the solution to the big problems and, and and that is that is the both the hope and the strength in basic science at least because you don't know exactly when you need this uh, this data and this this research so but but I I, I understand what you say. I understand the pain and also that to, to defend, to do science when there's so much problems around, that is very difficult. But if you really believe in what you're doing, do it. One day it might be extremely important. Last comment or question from you. Yeah, last topic. So some solutions is hard, 
where some attempts can be worthy. And I still see that scientific results are far away from people, normal people, that especially in Brazil don't have access to education or even are living in food insecurity during, especially during COVID. So my question is during this path to spread your knowledge in a high amount, what did you did to spread your knowledge in locally, I would say, not globally, but locally? What I can you do with like small power <laughs> as a young scientist? Because basically our results are being published in peer reviewed article and people don't have access to it. So what can we do in with small power? Mm. So um, what I think um, is the way into people's mind is their curiosity. So if you somehow can tell about your work so that people get interested because the worst thing for people and you can think about yourself too i'm a trained psychologist and if i would have come to you and put you into a category and say listen to me i know something that i want to tell you and if i would then be very arrogant and say you have to believe me and so then the situation would be much more different if I would come to you and say, I really think I understand something, but I'm not sure. Would you like to join me in this journey to understand? Maybe we can talk about it together. And I have this knowledge. And you, even with no university background, you can now I'm talking about a, a person that we are talking with. This person might have some experience, some ideas that would be interesting even for us coming from the university. So to be open and not put people who are not from the university into a category that you can't get this person to understand what you're saying. So that, that would be terrible. So rather think if, if I, it's my duty to get this person curious about what I know. Perfect. I feel that I'm in the right way because every time that I have the opportunity to talk about it, I'm talking about it. <laughs> so it's on radio, stadio, even church. Like, they give me the opportunity to talk about it. And you <laughs> jump on it. Congratulations. Yeah, exactly. Especially so, for those who does, don't have access. Like, my family, my grandmother, my grandfather. They, fantastic. They are my first source to spread my knowledge. Fantastic. So, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm raised uh, in what we call the Bible Belt in Norway. And what uh, we had a lot of missionaries there. And what I learned from talking to these missionaries is not to be a missionary myself, talking about the Bible and so on, but to be a missionary about science. Because what I learned from them is that if you have some burning knowledge, even if it's about the Bible or Jesus or science, bring it out there and do that and, and, and use your network, keep in contact and bring it out to people who would like to to listen and 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 and, and keep their curiosity there well done thank you so much all of you for giving us the opportunity for this conversation we are so grateful to you for taking the time to come and talk to us all and and with each other and um, uh, I, i'm i'm sure that the inspiration has been mutual so um, Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.